won't waste another minute, no, I won't. I'm a man on a mission. I'm a man on a mission. I don't need no permission. I'm a man on a mission. Welcome to Entitled to Nothing, where we believe our life is our fault. My name is Mink, and today we've got a special episode for you. I'm on vacation in Fiji, and I thought it was an incredible opportunity to sit down and talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is traveling. So I started this show because I have ran headfirst into failure after failure for the last 20 years of my life. And in that process, I figured out how to turn my failures into lessons. And I've used those lessons to create life on my terms, a life that gives me the opportunity to come down here and take vacations like this and talk about what I want to talk to you guys about today. You know, when I got started, I was just a scared, broke kid with six figures in debt and no idea what to do. And by learning how to turn my failures into lessons, I've now built multiple companies that have generated over $50 million in sales. And I'm really blessed to be able to live my life my way. And so I started this show to simply share everything I've learned on my journey in the hopes that it will inspire you and guide you on yours. So today I'm gonna talk to you guys about travel. Specifically, since we're here in Fiji, I was hanging out with Mike. We brought Mike down here to Fiji. You lucky bastard. He's back there behind the camera. And he was like, bro, you should do a podcast while you're in Fiji. And I started thinking about it. What could I talk about? You know what would be really cool is if I shared the top five lessons I've learned after traveling full time for seven years. For seven years, I lived in Airbnbs and hotels all around the world. I've been to 40 countries. And what I'm gonna do in this episode is just tell you guys the top five lessons I've learned and some stories that I experienced along the way. So before I dive into my travel stories, I think it's probably important to tell you how I got here. Because in 2009, I lost everything. And I had to sit down and really figure out what I was gonna do with my life. At this point in time, I was multiple months behind on my car, on my rent, on my insurance. My life was a wreck in every way. And I sat down one day just out of desperation and I asked myself, what do I really want? Like I was a broke real estate agent. I just lost everything. I wasn't making any deals. Real estate was a bad industry to be in in 2009, as some of you guys might know intimately. But I sat down and I said, what do I want? And it was an unanswerable question because I had no fucking clue. All I knew is I didn't want what I had. And I was smart enough at the time to say, okay, well, what don't I want? And I was like, shit, I know I got some answers to this. And I started writing and I don't know how I lo how long I wrote for, but it was at least 45 minutes to an hour. And I wrote down all the things I didn't want to experience. I didn't want to have to deal with. I didn't want to worry about. And when I read through it and kind of summarized it, what I was really saying is I wanted to live life on my terms. I wanted to be able to work when I want, where I want and with whom I want. And after reading that, I was like, well, dude, that's, that's what everybody says. That's what everybody wants. How are you going to make that possible? And I thought about it for a few days. And at the time, one of my good friends was a computer programmer. And he was telling me about these clients he was building websites for and how they were making money and what products they were selling and what they were doing. And I thought to myself, shit, if I could learn how to make money online, theoretically, I could work when I want, where I want and with whom I want. And so in 2009, I decided, I declared that I'm going to learn how to make money online. And my goal was very, very simple. I said, I'm going to learn how to make $100 a day. And once I can consistently make $100 a day online, I'm quitting my job, I'm selling everything, and I'm moving to the beach. And it took me about 18 months of blood, sweat, and tears. I was working my day job full time, working on my business, hustling nights, weekends, doing everything that I could. And fast forward 18 months, I started making that $100 a day, got to a point where I felt confident in what I was doing. I quit my job and I moved to Costa Rica. And in 2011, that's where my travel journey started. And for the next seven years, I didn't have a home. I traveled full time while I was working on my business and exploring. And I've been privileged to have some really incredible experiences along the way. So I'm gonna tell you the top five lessons I've learned 
in my travels so you can borrow from my experience and hopefully apply them to your life. All right, number five, we're gonna head down to the Cook Islands where I experienced the power of culture and kindness like no other place in the world. You see, I when I flew to the Cook Islands, I forgot to take out some cash on my way there. And so I get to the airport, I land in the Cook Islands at like 6 a.m. on a Sunday. And I go out to get a taxi and I go, hey, do you take card? And they go, no, we don't take card, only cash. It's like, shit, man, I don't have any cash on me. He's like, well, what, uh, when do you leave? I said, in, in about five days. He goes, okay, why don't you just schedule a pickup with me and you can just pay me cash when I pick you up? So I was like, man, I really appreciate it. That's very kind of you. Obviously, I was super appreciative. So he takes me to my Airbnb and I tell him, you know, pick me up on this day at this time right here and I'll pay you the, pay you the cash. So I don't think much of it. I go to the breakfast, I go to a breakfast place and I walk up and I'm like, hey, do you guys take card? And she's like, no, we only take cash. I'm like, okay, thank you. So I walk a little farther, go to another restaurant. Hey, do you guys take card? They're like, no, we only take cash. <laughs> now I'm like, shit, this is gonna be an issue because I don't have any way to get cash out and it's Sunday. So I have to wait till tomorrow to go to the bank to take cash out. So I go to the third place and I say, hey, do you guys take card? And they go, nope, sorry, we only take cash. And as I'm turning to walk away, the lady behind the counter goes, hey, 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 wait a minute, what's wrong? And I said, well, I just flew in today. I, I don't have any way to get cash out until tomorrow. And she goes, that's okay. She's like, just keep your receipt, come back tomorrow, eat with us and pay both of your bills. Now I've, I've never had a restaurant or a taxi driver say, oh, just pay me later. So this is twice in one day. I'm like, are you sure? She goes, yeah, it's totally fine. Just where are you staying? I'm like, oh, right over here. She's like, amazing, just come back. So I have, I, I have breakfast, I get my receipt, whatever. Fast forward a little while later, uh, my Airbnb host is like, hey, there's this amazing farmer's market. You have to go to it. It's like local, it's got the best food and the, the vendors are amazing. And I'm like, that sounds great. Do you know if they take card? And she's like, no, actually they don't. I think it's all cash. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, uh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to go. And she's like, well, why not? It's like, I don't have any cash. She's like, oh, well, let me get you some, one second. She goes in the house, comes out and she goes, you know, I think my husband took some of the cash that was in my dresser. So uh, if you just follow me to the ATM, I will take some cash out and you can just pay me back tomorrow. And I'm like, no, it's okay, you don't need to do it. It's like, I appreciate it. She's like, no, no, it's okay. The ATM's super close by. We'll just go, we'll take some cash out and you can do the thing. We drive like 20 minutes to the other side of the island. She goes to the ATM, she takes out cash, she gives it to me. Long story short, this trip in the Cook Islands, I, was, I experienced so much kindness, so much grace, so much culture that it really profoundly impacted me. And it reminded me of one of my favorite sayings that People won't remember what you say or do, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. The people, the culture, the conversations I had in the Cook Islands, they honestly, I carry them with me because they inspire me to lead with love, to lead with kindness. And it's also inspired me to really focus on building that type of culture into my businesses and everything that I do. If you have a chance to go to the Cook Islands, I highly recommend it, but you don't gotta go there to learn this lesson. People won't remember what you say or do, but they'll never forget how you make them feel. And oftentimes the greatest gift we can give someone is the gift of love and kindness. All right, number four, we're going to Croatia. I was traveling in Europe in 2019 and I went on a sailing trip in Croatia. I got to spend seven nights sailing through the islands in Croatia. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And one night I got up at like 2 a.m. to go to the bathroom. And I heard something up on deck. So I go out and I go up on deck to the, the yacht that we're sailing on and I see the captain and she's up there and she's like messing around with the anchor. So I go up to her and I'm like, is everything okay? She's like, oh yeah, I just have to get up periodically to check to make sure that the anchor is set. You know, when the wind blows and the tides and the currents, sometimes the anchor can come loose and I need to make sure we don't smash against the rocks. So I'm like, well, yeah, that would be a good thing. I go lay down and I keep thinking about this anchor. And I don't know why I connected these dots, but I realized that anchors can keep us stuck 
or they can keep us from hitting the rocks. And sometimes in life, we need anchors to keep us moving in the right direction, to keep us from smashing into the rocks. And the more that I thought about this idea, you know, I think the anchors that we need in our lives are a really crystal clear set of rules, values, and beliefs. You see, all of us have rules of what has to happen in order for us to feel a certain way or do a certain thing. And we have values that we say consciously or unconsciously that are important to us. Values of friends and family, values of honesty and integrity, you know, values of kindness or compassion. We all have our own version of values and we all have our own beliefs. And oftentimes those rules, values, and beliefs they can be an anchor that keeps us stuck or they can be an anchor that keeps us from getting off track and smashing into the rocks. And so I've spent a lot of time in my life really being intentional about what are the rules that have to happen in my life for me to feel a certain way, for me to take action, for me to show up, for me to commit. And what are the values that I want to live my life by? You know, I want to live my life by the value of health and energy, love and passion, joy, and gratitude. I want to be as present as humanly possible. I want to act every day from a place of abundance. I want to have a consistent action and discipline in my life. I say those to you because these are values that I literally have written down that I read every day and remind myself that this is the, the values that I want to embody and I want to live my life by. And I often think of that time I was in Croatia and how those values that I've adopted have become a positive anchor in my life that have kept me from getting off track or losing momentum or self-sabotaging in certain situations. So I can't recommend this enough. If you, if sometimes you feel like you're off track or you're stuck or you're not making the progress that you want, often it comes down to redefining what your rules, values, and beliefs are and getting clarity so you can have an anchor that propels you forward versus holds you back. All right, number three, we're going to Tanzania, down to East Africa. I went to East Africa in 2021 to go on a safari. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And I had two things happen to me there that really changed the way I look at things. They're really a beautiful lesson and I wanna share it with you today. So. The first place I went in Tanzania is a place called Zanzibar, which is this beautiful island off the coast of the mainland of Tanzania. And I remember driving and, uh, you know, there's literally kids out there playing soccer, no shoes on, running in the dirt, happy, joyous, laughing, dancing. It was one of the most vivacious places I've ever been. And it was one of the most poverty stricken places I've ever been. And I remember just the perspective that I got from being there. but. Uh, on my last day in Zanzibar, I went and I bought 10 soccer balls. So probably a very tourist thing to do. But I saw all these kids playing soccer and the balls were like deflated and old and half flat and torn up. And I thought, you know what, what can I do to give back in this moment? And I was like, I'll buy a bunch of soccer balls and just give them out to kids to, to play with. So I go buy 10 soccer balls and I'm walking through the villages and now I clearly wasn't the first person that had ever done this before because everybody knew what the heck was going on. And so I'm handing out soccer balls to this group of kids and this group of kids and this group of kids and I'm getting bum rushed by all the kids. They all want their own ball. And I'm like, no, no, you guys got to play with together and you guys got to play together. And I'm, you know, I'm trying to make these balls last. And I remember there was all these kids around me. And then there was these two kids they were kind of off in the distance on these super old rusted out bikes. And they were about 30 or 40 feet away and they were just watching me. While everybody else was swarming me, they were just watching me. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. They must not like soccer. And so I walked through the village and I probably walked, you know, about half a mile, mile, going through the village and giving different people soccer balls. And I had one ball left. And I was, you know, at the very end of my journey. And I noticed the two kids on the bikes were following me. This whole time, they had just kind of kept their distance, but they were following me. And I was like, that's strange. So I looked at them and I said, hey, do you want the soccer ball? These kids threw down their bikes and they sprinted to me. And they, they were so 
fucking excited to get that soccer ball. And I, I thought about it. I was like, why didn't they come up to me like everybody else? What was holding them back? And a little while later, when I was on safari, I had the opportunity to see the great migration play out. And I'm watching these wildebeest jump into the river. If you've ever seen like on Nat Geo or whatever, where these wildebeest are jumping into the river and the crocodiles come up and they're grabbing them and pulling them under. I saw this play out right in front of me. It was unbelievable. And as I'm watching, what I realized is some of the wildebeest would swim halfway and then crawl up on a rock and stop. And ultimately they would stay there and rest and the rest of the herd would go on without them. And next thing you know, these wildebeest, they were in the middle of the river, everybody else was gone and the crocodiles were just sitting there waiting and they were inevitably gonna die. And I was thinking about both of these experiences and I was like, damn, you know, the kids, I, maybe they, they must have just been too shy to come up to me. They were nervous or afraid or they were shy and so they didn't approach me. And the wildebeest, obviously they went halfway and because they didn't completely commit, they were bound to die. And I, I remember just like thinking about both of these experiences and kind of realizing that in life, if we're shy, if we're timid, if we don't go after what we want, and if we do go after what we want and we stop halfway, we're destined to fail. We're never gonna get what we want or really what we're capable of creating. And so oftentimes when I'm feeling nervous or shy or timid, I remind myself of this experience. And when I get started and I wanna stop, I remind myself, if you stop right now, you're gonna be like one of those wildebeest. You're gonna get your ass chewed off. And I use these as positive anchors to remind myself to take that move, to ask that person to go up there and go after that opportunity, to take that leap of faith and keep moving forward no matter how turbulent or challenging things get. And that's what I wanna encourage you guys to do today. All right, number two, we're going to Thailand. I love Thailand, guys. I spent nine months of my life there. It's one of my favorite countries. It's beautiful. The food is incredible. The culture is great. And I had this experience in Thailand where you've probably heard me tell the story if you've been following me, but I was cruising my scooter through the jungle and I come around the corner and there's this giant elephant standing in the middle of the road. And the elephant is on a leash being walked by this small man. Dude was like 5'8", like kind of small Thai guy, right? Walking this giant fucking elephant on a leash. And I was like, what is going on here, right? So I pull over and I get off my scooter and I'm looking, I pull out my cell phone, I take a couple pictures. And the guy's like, oh, you want me to take a picture of you? So I go over there, I take a picture with the elephant and I ask him, I'm like, hey bro, how, do you, how are you able to walk an elephant on a leash? And he tells me the story how they train elephants. He says, when the elephant is just a baby, we take this big chain and we wrap it around its ankle and we stake it to the ground. And at, when the elephant is a baby, it will pull and it will pull and it will pull, but it can't get away. And so what happens is the elephant is trained, it's conditioned that whenever there's anything on its ankle, it believes it can't get away. And so now, even though it's full grown, it's this giant beast, all I have to do is wrap this leash around its ankle and I can walk it. And I'm thinking, wow, that's, that's crazy. I get back on my scooter and we start, I start driving back to my house. And I remember I, I started to cry because in that moment I realized all of us have chains or leashes that hold us back like that elephant. Through our lives, we have been conditioned to believe limitations, doubts, other people's opinions, and we've allowed other people's perspectives or our own limiting beliefs to wrap around our ankle and chain us in place. We limit our own potential by subscribing to those chains that hold us back. And I remember I was just driving and I had all this emotion and I was cruising back and I was like, what are the chains that are holding me back? And the truth is at that time in my life, there were so many. We don't have enough time in this episode to go through them. But I wanna tell you this story because I have come to believe that the biggest mistake I have ever made in my life is not believing in myself. I wrapped chain after chain after chain 
of limitation around myself and I allowed them to hold me back, to weigh me down, and to keep me from realizing my potential. And I'm fortunate that ultimately I learned the lesson. I figured out how to remove those chains, how to recondition myself, how to get unstuck. But so many of us, and me too at times, we still allow ourselves to be held back by limitation. And the craziest thing to me is that so many of us defend our limitations. You know, oh, I'm depressed, I can't do it. I'm not that type of person. Oh, I don't know how to do that. I'm not good enough to make that happen. We proclaim these limitations and then we defend them. Think about that. Have you ever seen someone say, no, no, I'm really depressed. I can't do this and this and this because I am depressed. It's like, maybe, maybe you are. And I'm not trying to downplay the, the clinical uh, diagnosis of depression and the chemical imbalances that come along with it. But man, if you defend your limitation, you will always be bound. But if you have the courage to redefine that limitation, to step beyond, man, you can, you're capable of so much more. And that's whenever I'm feeling stuck, whenever I'm feeling bound, I think to that experience of that elephant. And I tell myself, don't ever let someone else's limitations or your own define what you're capable of, what your potential is. There's only one person that knows what your potential is. Well, two maybe, you and God. And maybe you don't even know what your potential is yet, but if you limit yourself, if you believe or subscribe to the limitations, you'll never find out. And I started this podcast because I want all of us to go after our own version of excellence to create a life on our terms. I'm sitting here in Fiji while I record this. And I, I'm telling you the, these stories with all of my heart because it is these lessons that I've learned through the journey of success and failure, of travel and experience that have given me a richness of life that I could have never possibly imagined. And it only happened because I found a way to take action in spite of fear to move through the doubt and the limitation that even though I was bound, even though I didn't believe in myself, even though I was scared and fearful, I still showed up and I made a commitment to never fucking quit, to never give up and to never stop learning and growing. And if we can make that commitment and stop allowing ourselves to remain bound by false limitations, our potential is literally limitless. All right, the final lesson, probably the biggest, most important lesson I've learned from all of my travels doesn't actually come from any one place because so many places that I've experienced throughout my journey have reinforced this. And it's the power of perspective. You see, the perspective that we take in life, the lens that we see everything through is going to dramatically impact our life, how we show up, what we believe and what we think we're capable of doing. Mike's got a couple cameras up right here and he's got different lenses for those cameras and how he sets them up is gonna determine how the shot looks and how you guys see me. And in life, the lens that we take, the perspectives, the rules, the values, the beliefs that we have define what we see. I remember when I first moved to Costa Rica, I lived with a, with a friend and this friend, his name was Mark. He was an incredibly successful entrepreneur. He had made hundreds of millions of dollars as a product inventor. And one day he told me this story. He said, Anthony, when I first moved to Costa Rica, I would go for a walk on the beach every day. And every day I would see this same man. It was this middle-aged Costa Rican and he had a spear in one hand and a trash bag in the other. And I was watching him and he was fishing with the spear. He was getting crabs and clams and fish and putting them in a trash bag. And one day I went up to him and I said, hey, well, you know, who are you fishing for? He said, I'm fishing for my family. And Mark realized in that moment that it was that fishing that was what the man was doing to provide for his family. That was how he got food for the family. And he said, every day after that, whenever I went on a beach walk, I put five, 10 bucks in my pocket. And when I saw him, I always gave it to him. And then he asked me this, he goes, do you know why I did that? It's like, no, Mark, I don't, why? 
I mean, I'm, in my head, I'm thinking, well, you're very wealthy and you're very successful, so you, you got it. You know, I'm just 20, 25, 26 at the time. And he goes, because what if that was me? I go, what do you mean? He goes, Anthony, I had the privilege to be born in the United States to a family that loved me, to a family that did everything they could to support and provide for me. Just like you were born in the United States with certain opportunities and advantages. That man was born here. And there's people born all around the world that, do, that grow up in an, in an environment of poverty or abuse or limited opportunity. And he goes, it's really important as men and specifically as men that were born in America that have the opportunity to make something of ourselves. It's in, we have a moral, ethical, and spiritual responsibility to be the best that we can be and then to pay that forward and to give back. And so every time I see him, I give him a couple bucks because what if that was me? He helps me stay grounded and rooted in the reality that I am where I am because of the outliers that existed in my life. And I just thought that was so beautiful. You know, I remember another time in Costa Rica, it was Thanksgiving and uh, Mark encouraged us to go buy some groceries and to feed some of the local families. And so we went and bought some groceries and uh, a friend told us about this family that was living in a, in a hut kind of in the jungle. So we went over there and there was two women, they were sisters. They had four kids between the two of them and two of the kids were autistic. They were living in a shack in the jungle, dirt floors, no running water, electricity. And that was their reality. And we show up with all these bags of food and things to, you know, help them. But I got to tell you, I don't share these stories to impress you or say, look how great I am. I do it to express to you that getting a different perspective in life will give you a different reality. I remember I was in El Salvador and I actually went there with a buddy, Kevin, to do some mission work. And we hooked up with the local church and we went into San Salvador, which was one of the most dangerous cities in, in Central America at the time. Lots of gangs and violence. And we were, we were donating food. They had this whole truck and they would give out soups and breads and food. And so I had soup duty. And so I'm in the back of this truck and I'm pouring cups of soup. And this little girl came up to me. Gosh, she was probably eight, 10 years old, maybe. Just this you know, adorable little thing. And she comes up to me and, you know, she's like, can I have some more? I don't, I don't really speak that good Spanish, but she was saying in Spanish, can I have some more? And so I would give her more soup. She came back to me like four or five times. I think I was only supposed to give people one cup of soup, but every time she came back, I couldn't say no. And finally she came back the last time. And I was like, I'm so sorry. We, you know, we're all good. We don't have any more. It's all gone. El fin, el fin. And then, and then I, in my limited Spanish, I said, uh, como te amos? And she said, Maria. And I said, uh, Maria, donde esta mamá? Donde esta papá? And she goes, no sé. No sé. I'm like, wow. She doesn't know where her parents are. Gosh, I get choked up thinking about it. And she was saying something to me in Spanish, and I didn't know what it was. So I say, I asked my buddy Kevin, I'm like, Kev, come over. What is she saying? And he goes, she's, she's asking you when you're going to come back with more soup. I got in the truck on the way home and or the way back to the church and I just sobbed because when we get a different perspective, when we go out into the world and we experience the way that things are, the brutality, the harshness, the beauty, the love, the kindness, we get such a rich perspective and it's that perspective that colors everything that we see. You know, you can have a lens that's black and white and shades everything in black and white, or you can have a vibrant lens that shows you love and kindness and beauty and opportunity and pain and suffering. Traveling and the experiences that I've had have given me the most beautiful lens to view the world through. And I often think about some of these lessons when I'm facing hardships, when I'm getting frustrated, when I'm feeling down. Because the truth is, no matter where you're at right now, if you're watching this, you're probably watching it on some $1,500 smartphone or listening, on it, listening to it on a $200 pair of earbuds. Our worst day is someone else's 
dream. You know, it's been said that two thirds of the world survives off of like $3 a day. And in the Western world, we concern ourselves with so much fucking bullshit. You know, a book I really love is called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. And in it, he very clearly says, in life, we only have so many fucks that we can give. And if we give a fuck about things that don't fucking matter, our life will be fucked. Now, that's a lot of fucks, but they're all 100% true. I wanted to share these lessons with you, these stories with you, because as I sit here in Fiji, I feel like this week is a combination of 15 years of fears and doubts, hard work, busting my ass, doing everything I can to get to this position that I'm in today. And I can tell you the only way I've been able to do it is because I committed to never, ever, ever giving up, to never quitting, and I committed to constant and never ending improvement. I wanted to use every failure, every defeat, every setback, every adversity as an opportunity to grow, to learn, to evolve, and to elevate who I am, to change my perspective, to add depth and color to my tapestry so that I could really find and uncover what my own potential is. And I started this podcast because I wanna help you do the same. I wanna share these ideas, these lessons, these stories with you in the hopes that they may inspire you to get outside of your comfort zone, to let go of your chains, to find a new perspective of your own so that we might learn and grow and evolve together. If you've made it this far with me, thank you for hanging out. I truly, truly appreciate you listening to this show. You know, I think this is eight, nine, 10 episodes, something like that. It's been a journey. I've been fearful to put these out there. It's been, you know, this whole experience. But the first time you do something is the worst time you do it. I don't know where you're at, but all I can say is keep moving forward. Use these five lessons to never give up, never give in, keep learning, keep growing, and keep moving forward. Everything in our life comes down to being able to take radical responsibility for our results. I believe all of the problems, all of the challenges in our lives can be solved in three words. It's my fault. When we take responsibility for our experience, we can create whatever results we want. Thank you for spending this time with me today while we're down here in Fiji. Now I'm gonna go hit the beach before it gets dark. You saw, if you're watching on video, you probably see the clouds are rolling in. Mike's behind the camera, he's getting a little scared. He's thinking, I can tell, he's thinking, hurry the fuck up, bro, the rain is coming and I got this expensive camera gear out here. So I've taken up enough of your time today, but if you've made it all the way through to the end, I deeply appreciate you. The only thing I would ever ask is if you found value in this, please share it with someone that you know and help us get this message out there so we can learn and grow together and we can inspire each other to continue to become the best that we can be. I'll see you guys on the next one.